You're listening to Islam for Life with Sheikh Walid Mus'ad. This podcast is brought to you by Seekers Hub Global. You can subscribe to this podcast and all of our other podcasts on iTunes, Google Play, or on our website, seekershub.fm. Visit seekershub.org for free online courses, our reliable answer service, and engaging media. So we come back to the text. We've done the first uh, five of the second set of chapters. Now we're on the second five, beginning with Bab al Zuhud. قال المصنف رحمه الله ونفعنا في العلم في الدارين آمين قال الله عز وجل بقية الله بقية الله خير لكم إن كنتم مؤمنين. So this chapter called Bab al-Zuhud or the chapter of renunciation. He begins with the verse from Surah Hud, بقية الله خير لكم إن كنتم مؤمنين. That what Allah has left shall be better for you. So it's interesting that he chose this verse um, to talk about zuhud because renunciation means that, you know, usually when we think of zuhud, we say zuhud fi dunya, tazhad fi dunya, right? To renounce the dunya and all of its trappings and its delights and, uh, and so forth. So if you do that, then what's left? Baqiyatullahi khayrun lakum. Right, that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, this is what is best for you. And that which is here, right, and the word baqiyya means alladhi yabqa, right, that which remains. And that which is, does not remain, alladhi yafna, right, that which is um, heading towards annihilation. Kullu man alayha fan, right, kullu man alayha fan. Everything on the face of the, the universe, all of it, fanin, fani, it's going, uh, it's will be annihilated. And here, the word that's used, uh, fani or fan, with the tanween at the end, is ism fad, which means that's what it is right now, not what it will be. So that means, just like when we say inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi, raji'un, raja yani. Uh, I'm already Raja. I'm already on my way back. Not I'm going to be on my way back. I am there already. So that which is contingently, as the ulama of Aqidah say, contingently existent, doesn't really then exist at all. Because without Allah, it wouldn't exist to begin with. So if that's what it's ayil, right, that's where it's headed towards, right, and the eventual reality that it will be no more, and this is only its temporary reality, then how much effort and how much striving and how much uh, you know, of our aspirations and our hopes should we put into it when it's something that is fleeting and that's not going to stick around anyway. Allahi khayrul lakum in kuntum mu'mineen. If you're truly believers, that which Allah has and to have the raghba and to have the desire towards Allah, this is what would be better for you if you truly know, if you truly believed. So he defines zuhud then, isqatur raghba, عن الشيء بالكلية وهو للعامة قربة وللمريد ضرورة وللخاصة خشية and another narration خسة which I'll describe why, he, why we would say that so إسقاط الرغبة عن الشيء بالكلية it means Forgoing in entirety something. In other words, not having the desire for something in its entirety. You don't want anything of it. So a uh, categorical or a complete uh, foregoing or lack of desire for something. This is what zuhud means. And here we're going to talk about zuhud fi dunya. So he says, هو للعامة, للعامة السالكين, right, for the most Wayfarers, qurba, right? It is a means of getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? In other words, to do without certain things, you know, as a means to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Amat nas that's what it is. Well in murid, the 
However, for the murid, right, or for the one who is a resolved uh, wayfarer, who is on a path, it's a darura, it's a necessity, because you will not achieve those maqamat that you're looking for or that you aspire to unless you leave aside everything that's going to get in the way. And the dunya certainly is one of the main obstacles that is going to get in the way. وَلِلْخَاصَّةَ خَشْيَةَ In one narration. خَشْيَةَ يعني it's a way of reverence. Um, why didn't he say darura? Why didn't he say necessity for al khassa for the elite? Because for them, it doesn't have the place in the heart anymore to begin with. And as we, as we'll see in the third level, he's going to talk, talk about a zuhud fi zuhud. A zuhud fi zuhud. Just like in the very sec, in the second chapter of, of this book, he talked about a tawbah min a tawbah. And people hear that, what do you mean a tawbah min a tawbah? You, you repent from your repentance? That sounds like you, you're not repenting then. No, it's not what he's meaning. He means, أن تتوب من رؤية نفسك لتوبتك. It means that you are repenting from thinking that I am a ta'ib, or that my toba is, uh, you know, is meaningful, and now I'm in this place of ta'ib, and I see myself as this way. This is a illa, right? This is a, a, a subtle uh, uh, malady that you have, a subtle disease. The true tawbah is to leave it complete with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not think about, oh, ana ta'ib, ana salik, I am this, I am that. Not to see yourself in it. And then when you don't think much of your tawbah then, right, and you still think less of yourself, this is one of the signs of acceptance. When you don't think much of your deeds, when you don't think much of the things that you do, it's a sign of acceptance. وَالْعَمَنُ الصَّالِحُ يَرْفَعُ In one interpretation, that means the good deeds are raised. So once they're done, you don't tend to dwell on them. Right? You're not still talking about it on your, on your Facebook status three weeks later. Oh, mashallah, did you see what I did in Ramadan? I actually, I read, uh, you know, the Quran like 30 times and I, I prayed like 100 rakahs every night and uh, you know, even the local Ontario news came out to film me because they couldn't believe it. And yeah, and, and then still putting pictures and, and video clips and, and so forth. You're dwelling, right, on that particular thing. Um, uh, al khas right, the one who is, they don't, they probably don't even remember they did pray to Hajj this night or that night. They don't even think of it. It's like so, you know, uh, Allah gave them the tawfiq. Why am I talking about something like that? You know, it's not the thing that they're going to dwell on because they don't think that much of it to begin with. So he's going to talk about that in, in, the, in the last part. So for bin Izbal al khassa khashya, right? Because, yani, amalan bi amal al anbiya. Because the prophets and the messengers, they, were, they had zuhud. You don't find any of them having, you know, massive amounts of wealth and, and, and entourages and things like this. So they want to follow the, the prophets. So it becomes a khashya, it becomes a way of drawing closer to the way of the prophets that way. In another narration, khissa which means that it would be um, a, a, a shortcoming. How is it a shortcoming for them? In the same meaning, at tawbah min at tawbah. One, one of my teachers, they, he said, al-haqiqat al-zuhd alla zuhud. The reality of zuhud, of renunciation, is that there's no such thing. Why? Because when you get to that level, you realize that that which is coming to you is going to come to you. Allah is going to give you. And that which is not coming to you, is not going to come to you. For what is it you are announcing exactly? That which Allah wants to give you is going to come to you no matter what you think about it. And that which is not meant for you, is not coming to you. So why are you saying, oh, I don't want this and it's not coming to you anyway? It's kind of like redundant. So for them, they just take things as they come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to say, ana azhad fi dunya, look at me, I am zahid, I am leaving this off for Allah. There's a bit of a claim, right? Fi da'wa. There's da'wa, right? And da'wa means that you're making a claim about something and saying, kind of, you know, I've reached this or I've reached that. Amma li zahid al haqiqi la da'wa. There's no da'wa. There's no claim. That's the way it is. So for them, it's like a khissa. It's like something that would be a shortcoming for them to say, ana zahid. Ana min al zahid. Wa hakira. Wa huwa ala thalath darajat, and it's three levels. الدرجة الأولى الزهد في الشبهة بعد ترك الحرام 
بالحضر من المعتبة. So the first level has this aspect. الزهد في الشبهة بعد طلق الحرام بالحضر من المعتبة. Is renunciation of that which is is questionable. شبهة, right? The hadith of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. دعما يريبك إلى ما لا يريبك. Leave that which is doubtful for that which is not doubtful. الحلال بين الحرام بين وأمين وبين أمور مشتبهات لا يعرفون الكثير من الناس. Right, haram, uh, halal is clear and haram is clear, but there are things in between, mushtabihat, right, that are ambiguous or questionable, not a lot of people know. So it's like the one who's going around the, the sanctuary, yushuqa and yaqafi, so be careful, so don't get close to it to begin with. So this is what we mean by shubhat, right, taqu shubuhat. So the first level of zuhud then is to have, to, to stay away from the doubtful or questionable or the ambiguous things. Ba'd talk al haram, obviously. By also leaving out the haram. If you're saying an azhad fil haram, that's not really zuhud because you're supposed to be doing that to begin with. So it's istilah and it doesn't really mean when you say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to be zahid, I'm not going to eat pork and I'm not going to drink alcohol. This is my zuhud. Had also on haram, right? But if you say, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to try to have some level of zuhud and I am, um, you know, I'm not going to eat something that I don't know the source of it, where it came from. It's questionable to me. I don't know if it was, uh, came, if the animal was treated in a humane and ethical manner. And so if I'm not sure of that, yeah, I'd rather be on the safe side, I'm not going to eat from that. Yeah, that's a type of zuhud. Because it's not haram, clearly, but it's something that may be on the kind of ambiguous or shubha side. So, بعد تلك الحرام بالحضر من المعتبة right? معتبة here means so that you can avoid blame not blame from people that's not what it's talking about we're not talking about people blame from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so you want to avoid something that you won't have to answer for later on في الأخرة why did you get involved with this and you were unsure about it and so forth complete avoidance of that type of عتاب right? of الأخرة وَالْأَنِفَةُ مِنَ الْمَنْقَصَةِ So the second aspect, الْأَنِفَةُ مِنَ الْمَنْقَصَةِ Which means to reject that which is considered to be a manqasa. In other words, that which is considered to be something that takes away from you, like a shortcoming. For certain people at, you know, when we talk about Ahlillah, the people of Allah, and we say that, you know, I can't imagine they do this, this or that. Right? We, you know, when we think about them, we, we put them on a pedestal and we see them as higher. So you want to kind of be on their coattails and follow them. So you don't want to do anything that would be considered to be something like this. In other books, they would say, شَيْءْ مُخِيلْ بِالْمُرُوءَ Right? Something that is kind of, um, you know, a chivalrous person wouldn't do it. Right? شَيْءْ خَسِيس يعني It's not something that... Uh, um, you know, someone who's of a stature of, or, or of a, a, repu- a reputable person wouldn't engage in that, even though it's not necessarily haram. So like uh, walking down the street while eating a sandwich, while it's perfectly fine in the society here and people do it all the time, but in many societies, um, definitely in, in, in uh, m- many Muslim and more conservative Muslim societies, to do that is a big yeah, I mean, faux pas, right? It's like... Why are you doing walking down the street and you're like, you know, eating your shawarma sandwich, you know, and the, it's dripping on you and you're walking down the street? And because it, actually, food is muhtaram, food is to be respected. You're supposed to sit down, and even you're not even supposed to eat it by yourself. You're supposed to have a, people with you and you share in the meal. There's etiquettes and adab that come from Islam. It's not just the society, but these that come from Islam that you should try to be observed. So, I don't want to do anything that's like. شيء ناقص, right? شيء مخيل بالمروءة, something that is considered to be, you know, not not reputable to do. Um, and كراهة مشاركة الفساق. So these are all like motivations, and you don't want to be in the same um, category as الفساق, those people who are, are who are, you know, reprehensible, فاسق, يعني someone who does مخالفات, someone who does a lot of sins or, you know, doesn't pay any attention to and doesn't have a deliberate sort of methodology in life and just do whatever satisfies them. You don't want to appear like them. It's not saying that you are one of them, but you don't want to do the same things that they do. 
right? So maybe um, I keep bringing up Arab examples for some reason. Uh, you, you go to the, uh, uh, you like to drink coffee and go to the coffee house, but you know, late at night after 10 p.m., it's all about shisha and nargila, and it's all about the, you know, the, the, the pipe that they smoke. And generally speaking, it's frowned upon. It's not seen as something that a respectable or reputable person would generally do. You may be there just to get a coffee or a Pepsi or something like that, and nothing wrong with that. But you're sitting in the same sitting amongst those people. So, karaha and musharaka fi hada, right? You don't want to be, be seen even, not by people. All of this is not people, but it's your own sort of internal resolve. I don't want to be in the same company or seen in the same company before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'd be ashamed as these people are engaging in this type of activity, right? And, um, you know, I think Muslims, they need to think about, you know, this, these things a little bit more because oftentimes we participate in some of these things that, um, you know, we, we think there's nothing wrong with them, but, you know, so like these, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, music videos and, and these type of music festivals and, and where people are kind of doing all sorts of things. And, you, don't, you know, why do you want to be in an environment, put in a position and feel... You don't feel a sense of shame before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you're kind of doing these things. You're not like them. Maybe you're not smoking weed like them and you're not doing the things they're doing, but they're doing it and you're around them, right? So it's as if you're in the same surah. It's almost like a musharaka. So, karahat musharakat al-fusaq. You don't want to be doing that. And so this is descriptive, not prescriptive, as I said. This is how they feel when they're in this place. Zahid. In this level, that's how they feel. I don't want to be part of that. الدرجة الثانية الزهد في الفضول وما زاد على المسكة والبلاغ من القوت باختلام التفرغ إلى عمارة الوقت وحسم الجأش والتحلي بحلية الأنبياء والصديقين. Here, as Zuhd, the first one is Zuhd في الشبهة, which is that which is doubtful. This one, the second level higher. الزهد في الفضول والفضول ما فضله that which is extra right that which is not in the realm of necessity uh, or what can be considered excessive or beyond what is your necessity وما زاد على المسكة right المسكة ما ما تمسك به نفسك yeah that which keeps you alive survival and what's and keeps you dignified at the same time we're not saying that we should just eat enough so we don't starve, but you live a dignified life. But that which is beyond that, um, not because you, you detest it, but you have better things to do. So that's what he's saying here. Right? Because if I'm so busy thinking about what I'm going to eat and how am I going to eat it and making the money that I need to do it and buy these things, then this is all not just taking up physical time, it's taking up spiritual time too. It's taking up time in my heart. So I want to give it its haq, right? Enough for me to live, but I don't want to give it more than that so that I can free up my time for what's more important. Free up my time for khidmah, for service, right? Service to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, service to people, whatever it may be, but something that's more important than just that which is above and beyond my necessity just to self-satisfy myself, is what he's saying. Amaratul hasm al wa tahalli, right? which means, you know, just so you cut off uh, gluttony, not just in food, but in even desire of things that are frivolous. Just cut it off from, from its root, from its source. Right? And to take on the mantle, hilya, the beautiful mantle of uh, of the prophets and the siddiqeen, because that's how, where they're at. Right? <coughs> Following people or trying to be like people of success, is success in of itself, as the poet said. والدرجة الثالثة الزهد في الزهد بثلاثة أشياء. So the the renunciation of zuhd of zuhd itself. And he said it's with three things. One, باستحقار ما زهدت فيه. واستواء الحالات عندك والذهاب عن شهود الاكتساب ناظرا إلى وادي الحقائق The first one استحقار ما زهدت فيه 
uh, belittling or feeling scorn for that which you have re renounced to begin with. So you're zahid in what exactly? The, the things that are extra and are excessive, they don't have meaning to begin with. So zuhd if zuhd means, it's, I, what did I give up actually? What I gave up is, doesn't have any meaning. It's only when you feel that the things that you gave up are, are important and meaningful that you feel like you've done a lot. Oh, really? That, uh, subhanAllah, you know. It took a lot for me not to buy the Mercedes S-Class, and I just went for the BMW 7 Series. That was like, you know, big deal for me. But when you see that it's nothing to begin with, then you don't see that there's zuhud. Because that thing is nothing to begin with. So why do you don't feel that there's a zuhud to begin with? Because it's small from that, that which you are actually making zuhud with. وَاسْتِوَاءُ الْحَالَاتِ عَنْدَكْ أَيَّ حَالَاتِ And to see the, the uh, uh, to be indifferent to whatever situation that you find yourself in. Whether you're in a situation of plenty, or you're in a situation of ease, or in a situation of difficulty, these halat are kind of all the same, because the, the point behind them is training for your heart. And so you see them as, you know, like, you know, one day it's sunny, one day it's rainy. One day it's cloudy, one day it's, you know, it's warm and sunny, and the other day it's not. So just to see it as kind of as the circumstances that come our way, you know. Shouldn't really get angry that it's raining today. I had nothing to do with that. I didn't bring it about. But this is what it's supposed to be for today. Yawmun lak wa yawmun alayk. So istiwa al halat. And that also means, you know, al madha with them, whether people praise you or the people censure you or rebuke you. Um, it doesn't have a, 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 a value to you because you're concentrated on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Especially things of the dunya. And then finally, وَالذِّهَابَ عَنْ شُهُودِ الْإِكْتِسَابِ نَاظِرًا إِلَى وَائِدِ الْحَقَائِقِ This one is a little more difficult to explain, but we'll give it a shot. So, وَالذِّهَابَ عَنْ شُهُودِ الْإِكْتِسَابِ So here, اِكْتِسَاب means that I am earning degrees, so to speak, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right, I, I have zahid, I skip this, I renounce this. So there's this idea of iktisab. So the hab an shuhud al iktisab, right? Don't be don't dwell with that, that it's me, I did this, because there's still ego in that. Nadiran ila wadi al haqaiq. But uh, reorient your gaze or your witnessing, your nadar, ila wadi al haqaiq to the valley of realities and truths. And in the valley of realities and truths is everything is by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's nothing that doesn't happen except, as we said before, by His will, by His qudra, by His power, by His knowledge. And so, but now we want to have a ha hal of shuhud of that. We want to witness that within ourselves. So why would we think we're making iktisab when all we say is, Allah gave me that. Allah is the one who made this, facilitated this for me. The verse in the Quran, قُلْ بِفَضِّ اللَّهِ وَبَرَحْمَتِهِ فَبِذَلِكَ فَلْيَفْرَحُ هُوَ خَيْرٌ مِمَّا يَجْمَعُونَ Say by the favor of Allah and His mercy, فَلْيَفْرَحُ Right, so you want to have shuhud, you want to have farah, you want to rejoice, then say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted me this. So the sentence begins with Allah and not with I or me or ana. <laughs> so, um, it's not the I, it's not the me, but it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in this valley of truths and realities, there is no other truth and reality. It is the reality. It is the truth. And so I'm not going to be busy with myself. So you don't see that you took something or that you left something, um, because Allah is the one who gives and Allah is the one who takes. Not you is the one who is giving and not you is the one who is taking. So you become too busy with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to worry about what I did or what I'm doing or what I am gaining and so forth. And that's actually going to be in the third level of many of these, that's where it's headed. Until it culminates in the last chapter of Tawheed. And true Tawheed is to recognize and have witnessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is Tawheed al-Af'al wa Tawheed 
al isma' wa sifat wa tawhid al dhat tawhid al af'al means that there is a unity and oneness of all the acts of the universe and that they emanate by, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there then those acts in the universe are nothing more than a byproduct of the effects of Allah's names and attributes fahuwa razzaq huwa al qahhar huwa ar rahman huwa ar rahim and everything that we see then is a tajalli or a manifestation of those attributes and there's a oneness in that and then finally tawhid al dhat Allah is one in his essence he's not in, he's not divisible He's not multiple, but he is one and immutable and unchangeable, and we don't have a concept or a comprehension of his essence, but we recognize that it's one. And so then our comprehension, at least in terms of spiritual cognition and dhulq, will be at the level of asma' wa sifat. So when we see someone who has sustenance, we say, Ada min amal al-razzaq. When we see someone who is compelled or overwhelmed, we say, Ada min al-qahar, hadha qahar. Min al qahar, and then we we recognize it within ourselves. When we see any manifestation of mercy, then we say hada min al rahman al rahim. When we see rafa, hada min al rauf, wa hakada. Right, and so then you see everything then as tajalliyat or manifestations of Allah's um, beautiful names and attributes. And that concludes the chapter about zuhud. The next chapter is about al wara sometimes translated as scrupulousness where he says and begins the chapter قال الله عز وجل وثيابك فطهر سورة المدثر speaking to the Prophet Muhammad uh, صلى الله عليه وسلم so what's the connection between ورع or scrupulousness and وثيابك فطهر and your Clothes make sure that they are pure. Even the Mufassirun in this ayah, they said that it wasn't specifically necessarily talking about the Prophet's clothes, but it was a metaphor for, you know, everything else. In other words, anything, the opposite of Tahir is Najas. The opposite of that which is pure is that which is considered to be filthy. And filthy in, 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 in the deen doesn't mean something that is like mud and dirt. But najas is what the sharia stipulates as ritually filthy. In other words, there is an aspect beyond the physical of it that makes it impure. That makes it impure. So um, dirt and mud and clay, if it doesn't have any other impurities in it, is not, is not filthy. It's not considered to be najas. Whereas you know, the finest bottle of uh, red wine from the Napa Valley in California, the whole bottle is najas. It's considered najasa. In other words, if you get it on your skin, I'm not saying you're drinking it, you get it on your skin, you have to wash it off before you can pray. So najasa then is not about if we're disgusted by that thing or not, or if there's a, a, like a physical, you know, the, it's not about how many uh, bacteria are in the, uh, uh, in the substance, but it's something that is stipulated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by the sharia. So that's what we mean by tahara and najasa. So leave off all that which is najasa. So with wara, then means to be scrupulous and careful and not to get um, involved in anything that would have the meaning of najasa, the meaning of impurity. And the verse here, that's how we, I think he relates it. وَثِيَابَكَ fatahir. So just like um, uh, water purifies something that is, you know, if you had that wine on your clothes, you just wash it off. You don't have to throw the thing away. You wash it off. So water is a purifying agent, right? And according to um, three of the four madhahib, uh, water is a purifying agent, not because that water can clean something and rinse it and it can remove the, the, the stain, but because Allah stipulated it. There's a ma'na ta'abudi, right? There's a meaning that in it that the water itself will not be purifying unless you make an intention that is purifying. So yes, the Hanafi Madhab doesn't, uh, um, doesn't obligate one to have the intention before wudu, uh, but it's recommended. Whereas in the other three schools, uh, legal schools, it's an obligation. So if I were to go and make the, the actions of wudu with the water, but I didn't have an intention to do that, then my state of, uh, of uh, hadath is not lifted. I'm not, I didn't make wudu. I needed intention. So that means 
that it's not just the water itself, but it, there's kind of a spiritual quality behind it that is infused in it with the intention. Then it has the power, at that point, to ritually purify the limbs and so forth. And even it's not about the physical washing of the limbs, right? It's not about, you know, what if, what if I didn't get dirt on my arm? How come I'm making wudu over my arm, right, or over my face? Maybe the hands I can understand, the feet I can understand, but, you know, why wipe the hair? And, and, and why wash the arms? These are, are ma'ani, right? These are meanings, right? And the Prophet Sallallahu described it. He said if someone was you by a, a running river and they were to wash themselves five times a day in it, how clean would they be? So the wudu then is not so much about cleaning the physical aspect, but it's about the spiritual, right? It's cleaning you and cleansing you of your sins. And that's what some of the hadith indicate, that wudu has the spiritual quality of cleansing one of the sins that can be considered like nijasa. So al wara then is then how to cleanse the heart of its spiritual najasat, of its impurities. And he's going to define it for us here, uh, where he says, al wara tawaqin mustaqsi ala hadrin aw taharrujin ala ta'zim. وهو آخر مقام الزهد للعمة وأول مقام الزهد للمريد So he says ورع, scrupulousness is yearning uh, or having kind of the um, I don't like his translation here In other words, having a, a level of, of precision and of resolve in avoiding uh, that which is haram, right? Or hadar. Hadar means anything that is haram or anything that would be um, even shubha, even thing that would be questionable. It includes those two things. أو تحرج على تعظيم, right? Or to... Uh, how would I translate this? You know, the, the reason behind it, avoiding those things, feeling a sense of, of taharraj, offense, you know, it's grating inside of you, right? One of the hadith, the, the meaning of it, you know, um, you know, that shubha ma yahukku fi sadrak, or something like that, that that which is questionable, you're going to feel a grating inside about you. It's not going to feel right for you to do it. So it's based upon التحرج على تعظيم تعظيم لمن تعظيم لله So it's based upon you seeing that anything that's a, a, an infraction, however small, is big. Why? Because the one that you are transgressing against is Allah. Not because of the thing itself, but the one you are transgressing against. So you take it back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is different than people who kind of say, you know, we have sins that are kabair, and we have sins that are sagair, and we have sayyat, and we have dhunub. So we have major sins, we have minor sins, and all those are true, right? But what you find, you didn't find the companions asking the Prophet ﷺ, is that a major sin or is that a minor sin? They didn't ask him, is that fard or is that sunnah, right? These are mustalahat, these are terms that came on later that the ulama used to classify some of these things, to make life easier for people. But if you look to the way of the companions, they didn't make a distinction between what was considered obligation and what was not. As long as the Prophet ﷺ was doing it, they want to do it too. Abdullah ibn Umar was, uh, and the son of Umar anhuma, was renowned for this. He would do every single thing the Prophet ﷺ did, even if he didn't know why. One time he was on his way in Hajj, and he was on his, his mount, and he kind of went to an area on the way towards Hajj and like circled around and came back. And then I asked him, why did you do that? What was, what was that? He's like, I don't know, but I know the Prophet saw him, I saw him do it. So I'm going to do exactly what he did in this point right here. And it's also said that uh, he was also renowned for marking the places where he knew the Prophet saw him was. He used this type of black tar to do that. And I was told by people I trust when they were excavating uh, uh, parts of Mecca uh, and, and I think Medina as well that they found remnants of that, those spots that he marked off 
when they did all of their excavation and things like that. People saw it. Because it's narrated in the Sira, narrated that Abdullah ibn Umar used to do that, and they actually found the spots where he had left his mark. So he was renowned for, uh, for following the Prophet ﷺ in everything. He didn't question about that. So the taharraj then, you know, the grading, you don't even want to do a, a, a little thing, right? You don't want to be driving and you have a, a piece of uh, a tissue or something, throw it out the window, and you don't say, oh, who cares, who's going to see, you know, big deal. No, it is a big deal. Right, because it grates. It's a mukhalifa, right? It's something that goes against, you know, the divine command. and he says, And this, so he considers it a type of zuhud with wara, scrupulousness, is a type of zuhud, because it's the last station lil right, for the average, for the common person or the common uh, salik. maqam murid. For the person now who's become a murid, now they are, they're, they're not mutaraddid, you know, they're not like, should I or should I not anymore, they're actually, this is what I'm going to do, then this is their first spot, this is their first maqam, as it were, their first station, bab al-wara. وَوَعَلَى ثَلَاثِ دَرَجَاتِ الدَّرَجَةُ الْأُولَى تَجَنَّبُ الْقَبَائِحِ لِسَوْنِ النَّفْسِ وَتَوْقِفِيرِ الْحَسَنَاتِ وَصِيَانَةِ الْإِيمَانِ So he says here, تَجَنُّبُ الْقَبَائِحِ which is avoiding things that are um, so he uses the word قَبِيح or قَبَائِح which means things that are, are, are ugly or things that are abominations um, and the Qur'an describes the sharia of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as um, you know, you harm alayn al khabaith, we harm al tayyibat, right? So the khabaith, things that are khabith, or things that are qabih, similar word, are those things that the sharia considers to be abominable, considers to be reprehensible. And so sometimes the sadiq on their way, they will have, even within themselves, it's not because the sharia says so, they also feel it within themselves, right? So there's a muwafaqa, there's an agreement with how they actually feel about something with what the sharia says about it. So they see it as qabih. They see it as reprehensible. So al wara then means tajannub al qabaih. And I think that's why maybe he, he, he selected this word here and he didn't say tajannub al maasi. He didn't say avoiding things that are sinful. He said avoiding things that are ugly, right? things that are reprehensible, things that are abominable, because now there's a level of mushahada, you see it for the abomination that it is. Instead of saying, well, Allah said it's haram, so I'm not going to do it. But not just to say it's haram, but you see it as an abomination. You see it as ugly and you don't want to have a part of it. That's the level of what I, I believe he's talking about. The sawn in nafs, right? The sawn in nafs, so to maintain the nafs. In other words, to keep the nafs in check, right? Because the nafs, it's despicable. Once it, it gets a taste of something that is like that, then it doesn't want to stop. It wants to have more of it, and it wants to continue. So the way that the nafs, uh, shahwaniya goes, the nafs that goes after shahwat and desires, it's a very slippery slope, and it could descend very easily, right? As soon as you open that, go, that gate, that pathway, and it could be a very fast kind of slip into that. So you hold it at bay, right? You keep it at bay and you keep it under a lock and key and say, you're not going, this is, this is your line right here. You're not going past this. That's what part of Ramadan is about, right? It's, it's keeping our, our nufus in check. We fast all day for 16 to 18 hours, how long we're doing it, right? Because we're saying, هذا حدك. You're not going to go beyond this. I'm going to keep you in check, right? And you're under, under my control now. Because I'm telling you when you're going to eat and when you're not going to eat, and I'm deciding that it's a it's a, a willful decision, right? Because when I'm hungry, right, we wake up hungry, even though we have suhoor and we have, I wake up at, you know, a couple hours later, I'm like, oh, I'm hungry and thirsty, even though I just ate hours and drank hours ago. But you're telling the nafs, I'm deciding when you're going to eat and when you're going to be satiated, and um, you're not going to decide that anymore. 
Because usually on a non-fasting day, oh, I'm thirsty, I'm hungry, I'm going to go eat. So your nafs is telling you, now it's time for you to go and eat. And you say, okay. And then you go, right? And then you open the refrigerator and see what's there. And then, and then like, hmm, that thing that was very sweet, I think I want more of that. And you say, okay, let me get more of that for you. Right? And you keep doing that. But now I'm telling you, not this month. I'm deciding for you when it's, how it's, what it's going to be like. So it's actually liberating because you're free of your ego, at least for the daylight hours, right? It's going to complain, uh, it's going to get irritable, and it's going to, you know, kind of fight and, and, and you know, want to run away and all these things, right? Because it's going to get mad at you, your nefs about this. But if you keep it in check till the end of the month, you can say, you know, I won this battle. At least for this month, one month out of the year, I'm winning the battle against the nafs. And perhaps it could extend into the months after that. Maybe show well, I can win the battle too. And maybe even in, you know, why in some of the schools of thought, um, they have six days of Shawwal is recommended. Because it's to remind you, hey, look, you still got a chance at overcoming the nafs. Don't just give up and say, okay, Ramadan is finished, let's move on. No, keep it up. Right? Only six days, though. You don't have to do, you know, the whole. And well, hasanat bi ashri amthali. It's at least counts at least as sixty days, right? And then the thirty days that you did in Ramadan, if they count as ten, that's three hundred. Three hundred plus sixty equals one year. So it's like you fasted the whole year. If you fast the six days of Shawwal after the uh, the thirty days or so uh, of Ramadan, and then. You put your nafs in check. So, sawn al nafs wa tawfir al hasanat wa siyanat al iman. Right? Tawfir al hasanat. In other words, to, to facilitate and make ease or to multiply uh, the good deeds. What's the relationship between doing good deeds and wara? It's easier to do them. Because now you are less busy with the things that you were not busy with before, from the frivolous things, and so it frees you up to do more of the things that you would like to do. Because now it's more about willful decision and resolve. It's not about what I feel like doing. So wala is kind of, he, he, he considers it to be a gateway from, from amma to murid, right? From just the average person to someone now who's doing it to resolve. So now your decision can be based upon, I know that there is this, particular spiritual outcome and effect of what I'm trying to do here. And so I'm going to live my life according to that and not just what I feel like doing. So that takes a level of maturity, obviously, and resolve to go to that point. And it will also free you up and give you more time and increase your hasanat. Because that in of itself is a hasana. It's a good deed. وَصِيَانَةِ iman And to safeguard uh, the iman, So what's the relationship between safeguarding your iman and wara? Uh, Allahu a'lam is when you take part in things that are dubious or questionable, right, which wara tries to protect you from as it's an extension of zuhud, then it will lead to more questions. And eventually, if you do it enough, it will even lead to questions that can affect your iman. Right, which can affect your certainty in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so um, when you effectively kind of put those questions to bay at, you know, at the level of deeds, at the level of wara, then you protect your iman, you're safeguarding it, siyanat al-iman, from coming into the, the fact of iman itself. Because our iman is affected by what we do. Iman is not a, it's not a passive list of beliefs, as many people might think it is. Iman is very active, right? The Sahaba used to say to one another, Ta'ala nu'min sa'a, let's go practice Iman for a moment or an hour or something. Let's make this Iman effective, right? So uh, the Quran says to the believers, Ya'iladhina amanu, aminu. 
All you who believe, believe. It's not redundant. Then an iman, يحتاج إلى تجديد وصيانة. You know, it needs renewal. It needs siyana. Uh, it needs to be maintained. It needs to be protected. It needs to be increased. That's all active. And those are going to be affected by the things that you do. They're going to be affected by the things that you think about. They're going to be affected by your internal states. It's going to be affected by the things you see, the things you hear. All of these can have an effect. The company that you keep, most certainly, is going to affect your iman in sense of the level of certainty you have in Allah and the akhir. And so... <clears throat> Wara then, as being the first maqam of the murid, protects you from falling into those pitfalls that can lead to doubts even about your iman. Al-Daraja Athaniya, the second level. Hibdhu al-Hududi andima la ba'sa bihi ibqa'in ala siyana wa taqwa wa su'udin ala dana'ati wa takhallusan min iqtiham al-Hudud. <clears throat> Second level consists in keeping within the limits Hibd al-Hudud of that which is uh, Objectionable Ibqa'in ala siyana wa taqwa So as to maintain The level of taqwa uh, And siyana here Preservation of the iman Wa su'udin ala dana'ati And to rise above Things that are um, irre- Irreputable Right, dana'a means things that are, are not, uh, you know, not desirable to fall into. Maybe not so much. It's, it's larger than that, than that which is sinful. It's a bigger category than that. But things that would be like we said, mukhil al muru'ah, things that would be not considered to be reputable to do. وَتَخَلُّصًا عَنْ اِقْتَحَامِ hudud, And also to avoid falling into the breaching of the limits, which is the hudud here is the clear, which is haram. So as we said, Zuhud and, and wara being kind of a higher, more refined form of, of zuhud means that you're avoiding things that are not just haram or right at the limit, right? If this is the haram here and here's the limit, it also means not getting close to it. And that also means recognizing that which is close to it and that which is not. He doesn't mention it here, but one should also take care that you um, don't fall into uh, what's called the tanatwa. Right, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi mentioned these type of people and he said, Halak al Mutanatiun three times. Right? The ones who are nitpicky about something when it's not min bebil wara. It's not about wara, but it's about um, being uh, kind of nitpicky and divisive about something that in and of itself is there's nothing objectionable about it. It's based upon ohem. It's based upon an, uh, something that is a delusion and not something that is ala lisan al ilm. Those things that are going to be objectionable, the Sharia says they're objectionable. Or the Sharia says that they're close to the limit. Not something that you determine on your own, right? Uh, and then you want to kind of impose it upon other people. And the thing about wara also, especially if you're in a position of leadership, is that you don't impose it upon other people. Imam al Nawi was the Mufti of Damascus. And. Um, if he was asked about you know, the meat of Damascus, his fatwa would be that if it's slaughtered in the proper way, then you can go eat from it. But his wara is he never ate from it because he just didn't feel comfortable about it. But he didn't impose that upon other people. He knew the distinction between that which is wara and then that which is clearly just halal and haram. And it's not the, uh, it, it would be dhun then. It would turn into oppression if someone was to impose their understanding of scrupulousness you know, uh, in, in a fatwa scenario or, or to impose it upon other people. So, you know, in San al Wara, al Qasra, he is the one who is avoiding and not getting to the limits, as he says here. Hibz al Hudud. So, you know where the limits are, right? So, that which is ordinarily not at the limit, but avoiding that so you don't get to the limit. Ibqa'in ala siyana. So that you maintain your progress with taqwa and maintain your taqwa. وَسُعُودٍ عَلَى الدَّنَاءَ And avoiding those things that are irreputable. وَتَخَلُّصٌ عَنْ إِطْتَحَابِ الْحُدُودِ And also so that you may not fall into and crossing the limits by accident. Right? Because if you're at the limit of something uh, and you slip, then you can just f- you find yourself on the other side of it. It's not too difficult. Right? All it takes is a slip. You put yourself in that situation, in that scenario, in that environment... Oh, I'm not drinking, I'm not smoking the weed, I'm not doing that. But you're in it. 
and you hang out with people there, and you're doing it consistently week after week and night after night, sooner or later you're going to fall into it. More likely than not. So, you know, don't kid yourself and, and say that it's, it's okay because I'm not doing what they're doing, but eventually that might be the scenario where you're going to find yourself in. So, iqtahaman, takhallusan min al iqtaham al hudud. Iqtaham means like you rush into it. You just fell into it and you didn't realize it. So, stay away from it. And that's, you know, if I remember what I called yesterday, I said, this deen is not just about pure willpower. It's not just saying, like, okay, I'm going to tell myself no, but I'll put myself in this difficult situation anyway. No, make it easy on yourself. Don't put yourself in a difficult situation. Stay away from the difficult situation, right? Have some shafaqa, have some compassion for yourself, right? Realize that your ego is a powerful thing, and it could lead you that way, and say, you know, I don't, I don't want to make it too hard on my ego even. So I'm not even going to put it in that situation where I'm going to force it to say no. It's not, uh, it's not uh, you're not a batal, you're not a champion, you know, by making your life extremely difficult, put yourself in an ex- extremely difficult situation, and then push yourself to say no or avoid the situation. That's not it. The, the true champion is going to avoid it to begin with and realize that that's a safer route. And then lastly, the highest one, التورع عن كل داعية تدعو إلى شتات الوقت والتعلق بالتفرق وعارض يعرض حال الجماعة. So this one is dealing with purely أحوال and not أعمال, right? With states. So it consists of التورع, right? Being scrupulous or avoiding كل داعية تدعو إلى شتات الوقت. Anything that is going to, I, I translate as you know, the dissipation or messing up of your time. So physical time and also your energies, your spiritual energies. So anything that is going to cause shatat. Shatat means like dispersion. You know, like when... You, I can't think. I can't focus. Why? Because I'm, I'm pulled in two, two million different directions. So don't get pulled in two million different directions. Remove the things in your life that are not important. Right, that are pulling you in different directions. You know, cut down on your social media use, cut down on, on the things that are going to pull you in a million different directions, and then have focus. So having what offer, anything that's going to lead to shatat, anything that's going to lead to losing focus. Focus of what? Of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What ta'alluq bit tafarruq, right? That's what tafarruq means, as we said earlier. Tafarruq means losing focus and being in it with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَعَرْضٌ يَعْرْضُ حَالِ الْجَمَعِ And anything incident or thought or fleeting uh, uh, passion that will get in the way of حَالَةِ الْجَمَعِ which is the opposite of تَفَرُّقِ So الْجَمَعِ means to be in complete focus with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? You may think you know, that um, watching that particular sports game or something like that, it's not haram, we're not going to say that, but it may cause you some shatat. Right? It may cause you like for that hour and a half or two hours and you just sat there and Allah didn't, wasn't like in your consciousness. You're just watching the game. And Allah wasn't there with you at that same time. This is going to maybe cause a setback in your spiritual progress. Right? That's why for, oftentimes for the person in the beginning, it takes kind of a steady routine of really trying to avoid those things that are going to pull you out, pull you away. I'm not saying that it's haram to watch or that you shouldn't watch it or anything like that. But realize that if your feeling afterwards is a sense of regret and loss to some degree, don't ignore that. That's, that's sadiq, that's, you know, that's, that's honest, that's true. And take that in consideration the next time that you're going to think about perhaps um, you know, doing the same thing. Wallahu ta'ala a'la wa a'lam. So we'll stop here for now. And we have three chakras left. I'm not sure if we're going to get to all of them in uh, 25 minutes or so I'll have in the next session. But... That which we can't do all of it, at least we do some of it. So alhamdulillah, <coughs> perhaps at another time we can, uh, we can complete it. Thank you all for listening. Jazakumullah uh, khair. Alhamdulillah. Thank you for listening to Islam for Life with Sheikh Walid Mus'ad. If you like this podcast, we'd appreciate if you left us a review on iTunes and Google Play. Help Seekers Hub spread the light of guidance to millions around the world by supporting us through monthly donations by going to seekershub.org slash donate. Your donations are tax deductible in the U.S. and Canada.